I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us online as well as the participants in this conversation. Uh, as was described, this is a event to explore how to hack DC uh, more directly. What is the future of cybersecurity and cyber threats? And to discuss it, we've put together just a fantastic panel uh, of, of leading experts uh, on this topic. To begin, we're joined by Nicole Perlroth, who covers cybersecurity for uh, the New York Times and also looks set to win um, Room Raider uh, with her background there. It's phenomenal. Um, she's the recipient of a number of um, journalism awards for her reporting uh, on topics like uh, Chinese government, intellectual property theft, uh, et cetera. She's also the author of a forthcoming book this is how they tell me the world ends that is the untold story of the cyber weapons market then we have um senator angus king who is a uh, senator from maine and before that uh, governor of maine uh and um along with him is representative mike gallagher who is represented from wisconsin and before that united states marine and they are the co-chairs of the Cyber Space Solarium Commission, which is a bipartisan commission of leaders and experts that issued some 80 recommendations uh, on how to improve US cybersecurity strategy. So it's a phenomenal group. And the flow of this is rather than having it uh, be each person giving a presentation, we're gonna take advantage of the fact that we can all be online and exchange. And so we're just gonna kick questions back and forth to each other. And so I'm gonna start it off. Uh, and the very first question is um, essentially tackling right on that topic. I'd love to hear from each of you, what is one way that you think cybersecurity is going to be different in terms of the threats of the future. So let's just go in the order that I introduced. Uh, Nicole, why don't you um, start us off? Well, I think in the future, the big obvious one that comes to mind is Internet of Things. And you know, we are just plugging everything we can online. Um, we have been for the last decade. Uh, and so all of these threats we're seeing right now in terms of ransomware, um, I think, it, it, and some of the more destructive attacks, I think we're going to unfortunately see an IoT component to those um, in the future. I think right now we haven't seen a number of attacks on IoT systems um, beyond some of the targeted attacks. There was the recent attack on the water facility that Israel has blamed on Iran. Uh, there was the attempt on, on the wrong Bowman Dam in, in New York, uh, but we haven't seen these things at scale. And so I think that is really where the threat's going to move over the next decade. Senator King. Well, I think, you know, you got to think, I, I'm, everybody's thinking about elections right now. And the more I think about it, the more vulnerable I think our elections are. We've had, we keep having we keep having warnings, uh, but things don't necessarily change. I mean, last week in Georgia, apparently it was a semi-disaster. Wisconsin wasn't good. 2016, we know what happened. Um, our election system, the conventional wisdom is our election system is such a hairball that it's nothing to worry about because it's so decentralized. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, a sophisticated actor can tell you Anybody can tell you which counties in Florida you should go for, which counties in Wisconsin or Michigan. And it really doesn't, wouldn't take a hell of a lot. And I think uh, we are way more vulnerable than we think. I've had hearings with secretaries of state and chief election officers, and they're almost cocky about how invulnerable they are. And I just don't believe it. Uh, and I'm very worried about the election in 2020. I think it could just be a uh, and, and I guess the final point would be, if you think about it, elections are exercises in trust. The day after the election, somebody tells you, here's who won, and you say, oh, okay, and you move on. Uh, what if that, that whole basis of trust is, is uh, undermined uh, one way or another by manipulation of re how results were reported, or what actually were voted, or who got to vote, or lines at the at the polling place, all of those things. And then, of course, you add the coronavirus on top. I'm very worried about uh, the vulnerability. Uh, Can I ask you a follow-up on that? 
Um, yeah. my, my nightmare scenario related to that is uh, not just a tax on it, but you phrased it as, you know, in the normal times, you find out the, the night of the election, the results. But if what we've seen out of, uh, for example, right now in Georgia, you have an extended, it seems more likely we're going to see an extended period of time of uh, just the basic counting of them. And that's in a scenario in Georgia where you didn't have, it looks like a major cyber attack. How do you think we're going to be able to weather the storm if we have a delay in terms of the reporting, particularly coming from um, battleground states or districts? What would that look like uh, in your space? Well, every, every day that goes by will be a, a, a new layer of uncertainty and suspicion. Conspiracy theories will be rampant. Uh, people will be, uh, you know, saying, you know, what's going on in Broward County or, you know, what's going on in, in Green Bay. And it's a, uh, I, I just, again, I go back, I mean, we, we take so much for granted in our country. And one of the things we take for granted is you go and vote, your votes counted the, that night, you find out who wins. Uh, suddenly, if the trust and confidence in that system is undermined, that invites, uh, I hate to say it, but it invites violence. It invites uh, people going into the streets who feel that their, you know, their votes weren't counted or that something crooked happened. Uh, this is, uh, we had an election in Maine in 1880 that was so close that uh, we ended up with Joshua Chamberlain locking himself in the state house uh, in order to talk down an angry mob. I mean, we almost had a civil war in the state over an election and uh, it just, I just, I just don't think we're anywhere near ready. I hate to, I hate to be doom and gloom about it, but uh, that's what worries me right now. And it may be a foreign actor, it may be a domestic actor, or maybe several foreign actors. All they got to do is undermine that confidence and trust, and they, they're ninety percent home. Representative Gallagher, do you want to get on on this point or a, a different scenario? Well, I just want to note a fun fact, which is that 1880 election was the first uh, uh, vote that a young Angus King actually cast. So, it's a first hand experience. <laughs> joking. I'm joking, Angus. Pay for that, Gallagher. <laughs> uh, no, I very much agree with everything Angus said. We had a lot of recommendations in the initial report uh, related to election security. And then our Pandemic Act, uh, Annex, not only talks about that, but also has a recommendation related to. Internet of Things, which Nicole uh, talked about, and I agree very much with what she said. So, you know, if I am trying to think about the future of cybersecurity, I mean, I think it's obvious to, to suggest it will be AI enabled, it will be faster, adaptive, intuitive, and that means that the threshold for access to tools will be lower, and a lot more non-state actors that uh, can do, will be able to do serious critical infrastructure damage. We were talking the other week about, you know, the next hor horrifying scenario uh, the next next Columbine doesn't need to be carried out uh, with a gun. It can be carried out by an ambitious uh, young person uh, with knowledge of cyber weapons and tools. And so that really concerns me. But I also think it's bound up in this bigger question, which we're starting to ask ourselves and, and for which there's a ton of proposals emerging on the left and the right about how we responsibly decouple our economy uh, and critical hardware and software from China. Uh, and I think w what the coronavirus crisis has revealed is how dangerously dependent on China we are. And I would suggest that regardless of who wins in November uh, and regardless of who's president in 2021 or 2024, I think we are on an inevitable process of selective economic decoupling from China that has important ramifications for cyber that's going to be extraordinarily difficult. And then the final thing I'd say to bring it back to the scenario that Angus was talking about in terms of that uncertainty surrounding the next election, I mean, add into that mix, you know, state-sponsored propaganda, whether it's Chinese Communist Party apparatchiks on Twitter uh, spreading misinformation or whether it's Russian actors spreading misinformation. And so unless we get our act together now, I think we're going to be in a very difficult situation over the next couple of years. Can I uh, follow up on that? You said, unless we get our act together now, what does that mean? What, are, what specifically ought we to do? So at least in the, uh, the pandemic annex uh, that we talked about, we really emphasize a lot of reforms. The Election Assistance Commission, for example, needs to be able to distribute grant funds to state and local governments so that they can ensure that alternative methods of voting can move forward, so that the administrators are prepared for possible rescheduling of voting, 
Uh, we suggest that the pandemic also illustrates the need and importance of paper-based systems to sufficiently uh, audit and certify a vote. Uh, we believe we can't afford to have several ballots be voided and that a paper-based system to check that any electronic system is accurate makes sense. And we recognize the irony of a fancy cyber commission recommending paper balloting. Um, but there's a variety of, of proposals related to election security in particular. But then we talk more broadly about the need for civics education, cyber education in K through 12 education so that we can you know, educate the next generation about the nature of, of, of propaganda and interference, but also the importance of voting and, and things like that. And I, I defer to Angus for anything else I missed there. Well, Peter, one of the big, big problems we're facing is the disorganization of the federal government in terms of dealing with this. Uh, one of our main, you, you asked a question, what should we do? And my, my glib answer is read our report. We have about 80 recommendations. <laughs> but one of, them, one of the major ones is uh, the creation of a position of national cyber director in the executive office of the president, Senate confirmed, presidential appointed, Senate confirmed. Uh, there needs to be somebody uh, overseeing the crazy quilt of cyber activities throughout the federal government and involving the, the federal government and the private sector. 85% of the target space in cyber is in the private sector. So the relationship between the private sector and the federal government is really crucial. But right now there's no one in charge and there's no one who the president can go to and say, work on this, or you're in charge of this, you're responsible for this, you're accountable for this. Uh, we think that's a, a very important recommendation. Uh, we're working, the White House is, is resistant to it. The National Security Advisor, I suspect, doesn't like it. No National Security Advisor would because it's some diminution of their authority. But I, I think it's one of the most important recommendations we have. The other is to develop a, 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 a strategy of continuity of the economy planning. We learn from the pandemic. We should be thinking in advance about the unthinkable. You know, what happens if the entire Northeast energy grid goes down? Uh, or if there's a simultaneous attack on water supplies across the country? What do we do? What are the steps that we take? Who do you call? Who do you activate? All of those kinds of things. So the two, two of the really important recommendations are National Cyber Director and setting up a, a really strong structure for developing continuity of the economy. So Nicole, I've been see, watching you, you've been nodding. Um, how do you assess, so they, we've heard these are the various things that have been proposed. These are the things we ought to do. Um, you're an observer of this space. How do you assess the likelihood of them happening in time? Well, I, I was actually quite impressed with the report. I had just finished my book and I just finished the epilogue in my book where I'd come up with solutions. And then the, the report came out and I put them together and theirs was better. Um, the, they wow. nailed it. It was the, we need a, a coordinator in the White House. We need someone running point on this. I don't know who that person is right this moment. Um, we need someone, especially with the election threats I've been documenting over the last six months. Um, you know, it is not just Russia anymore, although Russia has been extremely active in the disinformation space and amplifying the arguments we're already having with one another and starting with one another. But, you know, Iran is targeting the Trump campaign. Um, China was recently caught trying to break into to Biden staffers' personal Gmail accounts. Um, we... We know this is happening. This is very real. It's the only difference this time is that there's going to be many more players. Um, and so I was really nodding along with what the Senator was saying about, um, you know, we're constantly being told that the one thing that saves us from election interference is just how decentralized and tangled up it is. Um, and I, I, after, after what happened in 2016, I, I totally disagree with that and agree with the Senator. You know, all it would take is something like we saw um, sort of from software errors, not a cyber attack in Durham County when people showed up to, uh, you know, what in that case was a blue county in, in an otherwise red or swing state and couldn't vote uh, because the e-poll books had shut down. And then later we learned through these leaks that the e-poll book company had been breached by Russia. And we didn't know until 
six months ago, so almost three years after the election, um, that it was actually technical errors that were to blame. And there was a lot of tension there between the state, um, with Secretary of State in North Carolina, and Department of Homeland Security just taking a forensic look at their systems. And it, it just stuns me that, that we only found out less than a year ahead of the next election that actually, no, it, it was software errors and IT configuration issues to blame in a situation that had this, this terrible recipe um, for, an, for an election that we would all sort of continue to doubt. And one of the words I hear tossed around to describe what you were saying earlier, Peter, about the delays is this idea of a perception hack. You know, right now we are more divided as a country um, than, than any other time I can remember in modern history. And all it would take is um, a situation like we saw in Iowa with the Iowa Democrats primary where the, the caucus results were delayed for a couple of days for people to doubt the outcome of the election. And if you start doubting the outcome of an election in a political climate where we have a president that continues to use the word rigged um, to describe mail-in ballots, you really do have a recipe for, for uh, disaster. So that, I, was, I was nodding along. <laughs> I am equally terrified. Yeah, I think there's a, an interesting connection between um, what you raised on IoT and also in discussing the emerging threats to elections is that um, while the narrative uh, in both is sort of the whole system goes down, the all the power goes down or the in 2016, uh, you know, as, as Representative Gallagher alluded to, we saw um, disinformation campaigns that targeted the entire U.S. My sense of what looms in both IoT targeting, but also on the election side is more specific kind of micro targeting, whereas, you know, so it's not um, all smart cars are hacked. It's rather a specific numbers of them, all the way down to, you know, we play this out in the Burnin book, um, a single smart home being hacked as a new kind of crime, committing arson against one home, or it's not every single water treatment plan in the entire U.S. because there's this patchwork quilt quality to it, but I go after one. Same thing in elections. I don't try and... Um, spread disinformation targeting the whole, because that's a lot easier to detect now. I go after this specific district or this specific slice of voters, um, or maybe it's the voting machines in a certain location. And that, the intelligence side of it, is gonna be a lot harder to detect. Um, I wanna throw the question- Wait, Peter, back. can I ask uh, on yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead, jump on so in. Does that, does that, I mean, do we need some more widespread, what I would call Battlestar Galactica fail safes? I mean, for those of you less versed in nerd culture, you know the the idea that you know uh, you know the, the Galacta is the only ship that that survives because it's the least advanced, right? So as we ponder IoT and five G future, where everything is connected and the attack surface for bad actors is essentially unlimited, do we, particularly in the military domain, need to build in more fail safes or maybe less networked equipment or something else to minimize the risk of catastrophic cyber attacks? I, I, I think there's a, a different, you know, well, I, I, I love and we could spend the whole time doing, you know, BSG and, and, and frack and talk like that. Um, to me, the parallel is uh, we want uh, escalators that fail uh, in a way that doesn't mean the system collapses. Uh, so you want a system that allows you to have the most advanced, but if it doesn't work, you still have a fallback. Um, <laughs> Peter, there yeah, was a, there's a perfect example of that in Ukraine in December of 2015 when we we're pretty sure the Russians hacked the Ukrainian electric grid and they brought it down and uh, they flooded the, the, the call center and they brought down the electric grid, the lights went out and it, it only, but it only lasted six hours. And the analysis of why did it only last six hours was that the Ukrainian electric grid wasn't fully digitized. And there were some old-fashioned analog switches and, you know, people who had to go and throw, throw breakers. And it's exactly what Mike was talking about. It was, you know, back to the future that uh, because, and, and actually we passed a bill here uh, about a year ago that is asking the Idaho National Lab to look at uh, 
are there places in the in the grid where we could undigitize, not to screw up the whole architecture and you know literally go back to the 50s, but crit critical places where it can be isolated more easily and uh, a hacker can't control it because somebody physically in the, on the ground has to do something. So that's I, I don't think that's an uh, unrealistic uh, proposal at all. And, and in fact, it it's what saved the the Ukrainians uh, during that. A situation um, back three or four years ago, five years ago. And I would just add, I, I was in Ukraine last year and they were about to have their elections and it's all done on paper. The idea there that you would ever digitize any part of the election is just laughable, um, laughable over there. And if you remember, they, they had a hack back in 2014 where they didn't hack the election, but they hacked the reporting system um, to to project a victory for a far right fringe candidate, and they caught it just in time. But ever since then, they they've completely rolled back any effort to digitize any part of their election. And I think that's a model for us. Nicole, can I ask a question back at you? Um, so we asked you to evaluate sort of what you see of the space. Let's self evaluate. How is the media equipped to report? these kinds of stories, uh, whether it's IOT hacks or election hacks, do you think the media is uh, well equipped to tell the story the right way or will it um, either spread, you know, fear, uncertainty or doubt or even in some situations aid the attacker in their very goal to spread distrust as the, as the two members of Congress have laid out? I knew you were going to ask this. <laughs> so um, I think, no, I don't think the media is prepared. And I think, I mean, one of the things I've tweeted publicly and I've said publicly um, is we need to be very prepared in the media for when the hack and leaks come. And I, I do expect they will come this election season. We need to have a big red box um, at the top of those stories to tell our readers where that material came from if we plan on reporting on it the way that the media reported on some of those hacks and leaks in 2016. Um, that's just one example. Um, I think people really don't understand. Let's just look at Russian disinformation right now. I don't think people and I don't think the media really understand what it looks like. I think when we got that report back in February that um, Russian, Russia was once again trying to meddle to reelect uh, the president and also to boost uh, Senator Sanders' candidacy. Um, I don't think people really understood what that looked like on the ground. And what it looks like on the ground right now, I'm just working on the story that I think will be out today if it's not already out, um, is it's just Russia is just pushing distrust. They're just pushing populists versus the establishment. The ultimate goal is total, uh, is that we'll be tied up in so much of our own political infighting on both sides of the political spectrum that we won't be equipped to uh, check Russia as it maneuvers however it wants. And I think that's actually already playing out. And so I don't think the media fully understands what that dynamic looks like and that, uh, partisan infighting and, and these vitriolic um, partisan uh, battles we see playing out every day is the goal. Um, and I think if we had some broader informed perspective of, about what the ultimate end goal of these, um, of these Russian disinformation campaigns look like, we might be able to at least have a, a couple paragraphs in some of these stories that offer some of that context. And right right now, I don't think we're anywhere there. So I want to toss this back to the members of Congress. You are part of what feels like one of the last or bipartisan efforts, uh, <laughs> at least observing from the outside. Do you think that um, is possible in our space? Well, let me respond first, because last week, uh, Peter, we had, a, we had the markup of the National Defense Authorization Act and we got, I think, 10 or 11 of our recommendations into that uh, markup. Uh, and there's room for uh, several more as we move forward in that process. And that was all on a bipartisan basis. This commission was a very interesting one. There were, there were 14 members, uh, four members of Congress. And of course, we know 
you know, their party. There were uh, uh, Mike as a Republican and Jim Longevin in the House, a Democrat, Ben Sass, Republican, I'm an independent. And uh, so that was the makeup there. The other 10 members of the commission, which came from the administration or from the executive and from the private sector, I haven't the faintest idea of their politics. I haven't the faintest idea of who belongs to which party, how they voted, who they supported. Uh, and that's the way it ought to be. We had over, I think we had 30 meetings and lots of discussion, lots of debate and, and differences of opinion. Partisanship was never, there was, there wasn't a whiff of it and that's how it, it should work. And I think uh, we're gonna be able to do a lot of the recommendations on that basis. This doesn't seem to, to be a partisan issue. I'll never forget one day in the intelligence committee when we were talking about you know the Russians and, and the Trump campaign, Marco Rubio said, look, uh, folks, Putin is not a Republican. Uh, he, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's an opportunist. And, and next time, it could be us. Uh, and I thought that was an important insight, that somehow, uh, right now, you know, or at least in 16, the Russians were attempting to help Mr. Trump. But next time, they may not. They may go in the other direction. This is, a, this is dangerous no matter what the party is. And, and so I don't see this as a partisan issue. It has a partisan flavor now, particularly when you talk about Russia, because the president has never acknowledged that Russia played an active role in that, in that election, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, by and large, I think people understand this is a danger. And individual candidates are starting, we're starting to, to see and feel this. Uh, either from other countries or, you know, the whole thing about deep fake and uh, uh, conspiracy theories and, and wild accusations, altered photographs, all of those kinds of things. That's starting to happen to us as individual candidates. And that's when uh, people understand the nature of the threat. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think Angus really set the tone from the top at the outset of a bipartisan tone or transpartisan or whatever the, the term is. And it was his leadership that I think got everyone to work together. There were a lot of times when I as sort of, you know, I'm supposed to be the evil hawkish Republican on the commission. I felt like the dove and, you know, Angus and I had tensions on certain deterrence related issues. But I think ultimately what we're trying to do in the report, and Nicole, you were incredibly kind with that assessment, was to lay out a strategy that we call layered cyber deterrence and a set of reform measures that will endure beyond the November election, or at least convince a, a group of people in the White House and Congress to study these issues with, a, with not just a, a short-term reactive perspective, but a long-term, how do we restore some semblance of deterrence in cyberspace and cultivate that expertise both within the executive branch and the legislative branch that we think is necessary to defend the country uh, in this space. And so it creates a lot of very strange bedfellows. Some of our strongest allies when it comes to the National Cyber Director recommendations are actually Republicans in the Senate. And it, the whole thing is just, you know, it really, there's not, there's no clear ideological or partisan fault lines a lot of the time. I wanted to weave in a question that um, Anand Shah posted uh, on the chat, which is about um, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and they framed it in terms of how did it, did it lead us to think about um, uh, critical infrastructure in a different way. And um, Senator King, why don't you lead off, uh, not just in terms of, why don't we frame it this way, how did you, the pandemic affect your thinking? So you had this report come out, 80 major recommendations, and then we've moved into a new phase in American life and politics, and you've recently had a series of uh, follow-on recommendations. So how did the pandemic affect the way that you and the commission were thinking about these issues? Well, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. We, in fact, when we found ourselves in the midst of the pandemic, the, the report was released. The release of our report was one of, the, one of the last large gatherings in Congress. I think it was something like March 11th. And if it had been two or three days later, we probably wouldn't have had that meeting up in the hard Senate office building with a couple hundred people. But, uh, we then found ourselves in the middle of this and we said, well, what can we learn from this? So we, we did a, additional study and discussion and created an appendix that uh, was released a, a, a few weeks ago, you know, about lessons learned from the pandemic. One, one clear lesson is the whole work at home uh, 
idea, which has been, which has really sustained us through this thing, uh, has created a whole new set of targets, or at least a, an expanded set of targets. I mean, imagine for a moment what the effect on our economy would be if we didn't have the technology to work at home. Uh, we had, you know, 40 million people out of work. It would have been more like 100 million uh, if, if all the people that work for insurance companies and, and engineering firms and those kinds of things couldn't have worked from home. Um, so that's created a whole new target space. That's, that's one thing. It also pointed up the importance of, gets back to the national cyber director, uh, having somebody in charge, uh, having somebody in charge not only of the response but of the planning, uh, it goes back to the it, it sort of underlined our belief that there has to be continuity of the economy planning. I mean, the, in some ways, the the pandemic was a was a a, a wake up call, or even more than had been in the uh, before that, saying you know here's how interconnected you are, here are the risk levels, here's what you should be thinking about and that you got to be planning ahead. You got to think about the, un it, it really is, think about the unthinkable. And, uh, you know, that's how you learn. I mean, in the military, you always have an after action review and we ought to be looking at the pandemic and the response, which by the way, is not over by any means, uh, and say, okay, what do we learn from this and how do we apply it to a similar kind of catastrophe only on the cyber side? Representative Gallagher. Well, we had our first cute child alert in the background there. So we did. Was, we did. We had a lead, we brought in extra cybersecurity uh, uh, advice and expertise. Very, very good. Uh, I should say I went to college with Nicole, and I was. I mean, I was a nerd talking about Battlestar Galactica. So she may have been unaware of my existence, <laughs> but it's been awesome to see all of her success and her great work. Um, so I agree emphatically with everything uh, Angus just said. I think if anything. Uh, the pandemic not only, uh, I think, reinforced recommendations on reorganization, National Cyber Director, but made us realize that we uh, undervalued uh, security of, of Internet of Things, to tie it back to something Nicole mentioned at the, at the outset. Uh, so one of our new recommendations is to ensure, uh, what to, to get Congress to pass an IoT security law, focusing on known challenges like insecurity of Wi-Fi routers, and mandate that devices have reasonable security measures, such as those outlined under NIST's uh, recommendations for IoT device manufacturers. And I think that recommendation kind of gets to this, this uh, needle we tried to thread in the report of, we very much did not want to take a prescriptive, top-down, heavy government mandate and regulation approach. We want approach, we want the market to work, but we do believe that the federal government needs to create incentives in this space uh, and certainly when it comes to cloud security and iot that's an area where we try to do we try to achieve that incentivization without being too heavy-handed from the federal government so one of the questions that's been posed in the chat is um our workforce uh capabilities um you know this is both a technology and a people problem and as a number of reports have alluded to we have uh insufficient um, talent in this space. Uh, there's a numbers crunch. Uh, what do you think are the best ways to go after that? And how are we doing in terms of meeting our current and future needs? Well, it is, it, it's a crucial requirement there. There's a, we discussed the workforce pretty extensively in the, in the report. We've just got to think in, in, a, in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, we, we need to have scholarships. I mean, <laughs> this is talk about back to the future. My mother went to college in the 20s on a scholarship, which basically said for every year you get to go to William and Mary, uh, you have to teach for a year in Virginia public schools. Uh, it was a kind of indentured <laughs> servitude. But we need to be thinking about those kinds of things. You know, the, the ROTC, we need a, a, a cyber ROTC where we provide scholarship help and support for students who make a commitment to, to public service when they get out on the, on the cyber side. We also, and I've talked with the military about this, we have to think about uh, what the real requirements are for a cyber warrior. Uh, do you really need to be able to do 100 push-ups in order to be a cyber warrior? Maybe, you know, I don't mean lower the standards, but, but just we need to think a little bit differently. There's an enormous amount of cyber talent out there. Think of all the kids who at this very moment are playing pretty sophisticated video games. 
we need to figure out how to tap that talent. I, I, I was told the other day there's something like 35,000 IT related jobs in the federal government that are empty. Uh, so to say there's a need is a really understatement. So it's gotta be a kind of all hands on deck. There's no one solution, education reform, uh, scholarships, uh, marketing, all of those things. But it's a, it is a serious, it is a serious problem. And it's one that, that we need to address in a, you know, no, no single solution, but in a, a multiplicity of ways. So Representative Gallagher, I saw you uh, nodding your head on that. You want to jump in? Well, I just think we have a lot of uh, recommendations on, you know, 20% increase in the cyber core scholarship program, uh, trying to get the military to improve its transition assistance program. So when you transition off active duty, at least when I went through it, the program was terrible. It doesn't set you up for success, particularly for a young Lance Corporal, you know, seeing if you can spot and identify the people that have talent and immediately as they come off active duty, slot them into a cybersecurity role. But I think and maybe Angus would disagree on this, but I think as we looked at this, we kind of came to the conclusion that even in the best case scenario, if we really improve pay, improve hiring flexibility, you know, allow that young kid with purple hair who doesn't want to do, uh, you know, push-ups or get a high and tight to nonetheless be a cyber warrior, there's still, we get to this point where we still are never going to be able to compete with Google and whoever on pay and lifestyle, right? But we can compete on mission from the federal right. government, right? The NSA has a cool mission. I mean, you can do things there that you can't do anywhere else. Similarly, if we uh, elevate uh, CISA and make its mission just as appealing and as, as sexy as, as, as Cyber Command and NSA, we believe that you know, an organization like CISA, which is charged with defending our critical infrastructure and our domestic networks, can occasionally compete with and attract talent uh, and, and beat Google and Facebook and, and the other companies that might be able to offer a far you know, bigger paycheck than the federal government ever will be able to. Can I follow up? Um, we've talked about the pipeline into the military or we talked about CISA. Why do we not have an auxiliary for that in terms of you know, not people becoming direct cyber warriors but a broader, you might think of it as a reserve corps. You think about what Estonia has in the Cyber Defense League. What we have at certain state levels, Michigan has a cyber corps that's, again, not part of their National Guard. It just strikes me as such a gap that um, the Coast Guard has an auxiliary that helps it do boat inspections. We have the Civil Air Patrol that can mobilize to help with aviation-related emergencies and yet we don't have a cyber equivalent. What, what would fill that gap? Because again, if it's well, just sending more people into the military or directly joining government, it still leaves a massive well, gap. We, Peter, we almost do in the sense there's a lot of cyber capacity in the National Guard. Uh, people who work in the private sector as you know, engineers, IT engineers and other things who are in the National Guard, and there, there are guard units around the country that have tremendous cyber capability. So that's not a, fully, a full answer to what you're talking about, but, uh, but I, I think there, there, there is activity going on in, in, that, uh, in that area. And I, I agree with what Mike said about making, uh, making the transition out uh, uh, better. Peter, I don't wanna uh, miss, since our time is, is running out, uh, talking about the international aspects of this and, and norms and standards. Um, uh, part of our report talks about the importance of having international norms uh, about cyber crime and, and cyber use of cyber uh, so that it's, it's part of the deterrent strategy. Uh, we want malicious cyber actors to to know that they're going to be international pariahs if they if they do so, and they're going to pay a price internationally, and that's that's an important part of our recommendation. I just think I, I just wanted to be sure we got that that message across. Can I chime in? We do ask uh, CISA to look at the creation of a civilian cyber reserve, you know, ideally creating something that might you know 
you know, I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I didn't, I did the reserves for a little bit, but I ended up just not wanting to do it. And I think there are a lot of people for whom they want to serve, but maybe the National Guard or the reserves isn't an attractive option. So theoretically, CISA could cre create something that's a bit more attractive. But I'd be curious, Nicole, if you mentioned the epilogue of your book, you know, and kind of recommendations you laid out, what did you arrive at any hypotheses about the human element of this and how we can Im improve recruitment? Because I do think it's the most important part. It's all about getting- uh, I agree. And, and, I, and thanks for asking. I think one thing that we have to always remember is we're at such a disadvantage in, in a capitalist society, in a democracy. Um, we don't have the same advantage that China does where it can tap some of its best engineers in the private sector to do some of its moonlighting and contracting after hours. And we don't have the benefit of being a Russia where we're just going to let an entire cybercrime industry do whatever it wants so long as it doesn't hack inside Mother Russia and um, does favors for the government every once in a while. We just don't have that. So we are already at a huge disadvantage in this case. And I think some of the efforts, I think that they are still baby steps, but I think they're a move in the right direction and might be a model for, for scaling up is you know within the pentagon right now they are doing um within the and i'm sorry i'm blanking on the name of it but it's uh the digital defense agents something um you can look it up there they basically uh they they are taking people for one two year tours of duty um from microsoft from some of the security firms um, just to take a look at some of the low-hanging fruit um, on, on .gov and .mil and, and locking up those systems. So that's a start. Um, they are also engaging um, SYNAC, for, for instance, in some of the private bug bounties where they're calling in some of the, the best engineers from Microsoft, from the security space, from the hacking community, um, and asking them to take a look at uh, the networks that that are attached to our weapon systems, for instance, and patching up those holes. But I actually think we could do something um, even more ambitious, something like a Google Project Zero, where we recruit some of the best security people at these companies. It wouldn't even have to be two years. It could be a year. Spend a year um, you know, doing the service for your country, get Google to help with some of the pay on the back end or some of these technology companies or something like the Linux Foundation, which is really interested in locking up our open source code um, and get people who are big names in this space to volunteer to do a year of, of duty, um, basically hacking the government and seeing um, where we are most vulnerable or alternatively, if we do find ourselves, um, you know, in a situation where we do need to call up sort of cyber reserve, have those people be a part of that natural talent pool that you would tap. So I want to hit a couple more of the questions that we're seeing in the chat here. So uh, this is going to go. Um, let's just go round round robin on it. Uh, We've created a new branch of the military, uh, Space Command, uh, Space Force. It should have been command, in my own personal opinion. So, uh, will there is there a need to create a new military service on the cyber side? And we've got it. it we, we've got it. Uh, cyber Command. Uh, the the question is whether it's uh, strong enough. There are about six thousand people. One of our recommendations is that that the Pentagon. Uh, do an analysis of whether that's enough. Uh, the commander of Cyber Command is Paul Nakasone, who's also the head of the NSA. Traditionally, those have been uh, two different jobs held by the same person, the so-called dual hat uh, arrangement. Whether that is uh, sensible going on into the future is, a, is something that's debated practically every year. But we do have Cyber Command. Uh, I personally don't think it's uh, it's strong enough. I mean, it, this raises a sort of fundamental question of, are we, uh, are we fighting the last war? Are we preparing for a war that is unlikely to take place in terms of guns and missiles and ships and airplanes and not sufficiently preparing for what is, I think, more likely uh, the next war, which will uh, be bits and bytes? So Representative Gallagher, I'm going to put that in a two-part question then. One, uh, should we have a cyber as a separate service given that we did so for space, uh, 
why would we have a space one and not a cyber one? And second, dual hat or not, should we uh, continue with the current double structure of the leadership within SA? Well, so first of all, it should have been space core and it should have been subordinate to the Navy. It's fundamentally a naval mission. Look no further <laughs> than the rank structure in Star Trek. It's Captain Jean-Luc Picard. I mean, these are Navy ranks, so I rest my case on that. Um, I, uh, I agree with what Angus said uh, about it's less a matter of creating, you know, a new service uh, than it is. I mean, it's hard to create two new services in less than a decade than it is adequately resourcing Cyber Command, uh, giving new acquisition and budget authorities to Cyber Command, uh, and seeing what the new force structure assessment comes out uh, with. Uh, we, for example, are recommending allowing uh, existing agencies to do threat hunting on defense, intel uh, defense industrial based networks, allowing CISA to do uh, threat hunting on .gov networks in the way Cybercom can do it on uh, .mil networks. So I think it's, we sort of took the approach of uh, taking uh, what we have right now and elevating and empowering existing agencies rather than creating a bunch of new ones. Uh, as for the dual hack question, very controversial but we've asked uh, DOD to tell us where it has met certain expectations, uh, you know, uh, and, and where it hasn't. And so it, I'm, I'm punting on that one politically right now. Look, if I, I had my punt. choice, I'd, I'd put Paul Nakasone in charge of several other parts of the government. I mean, he's, he's one of the most talented people that we have. Uh, I will not punt on it. Um, I do not believe that uh, Space Force was needed if we were going to create a new service it should have been on the cyber side given that uh the space issue is mostly a uh, was an acquisitions problem versus cyber it was everything from acquisitions to it's highly operational uh also if you're going to talk about uh creating a new service that means a whole new service culture and the like and clearly as we're going back to the human side cyber is one where having a very different culture uh, makes a lot more sense than space, given that um, despite all the advertising, no one from Space Force is going into space anytime soon versus the cyber side, they're all operational. And so having a very different identity, uh, promotion and the like made more sense. And I also think we uh, should split the dual hat that um, having a uh, simultaneous head of NSA and um, Cyber Command is uh, like having a um, the same person be a general manager of uh, the Patriots and coach of the Celtics. They're uh, <laughs> two different games. Uh, even so, even if you have a talented person. And and sorry for Representative Gallagher, I didn't use the idea of having the same general manager um, and coach uh, reference for the Packers because we saw how that went uh, previously. Um, well, it worked under Lombardi. He had full authority <laughs> for all of that. So. Many, many, many Matter generations point. back. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump into, um, I think we've got time for one last uh, question. And um, actually, we'll, we'll ping off of on the Packers side. So there is a saying that if you have two good quarterbacks, you actually have none which is something about to play out in terms of draft strategy there. So in terms of priorities, of all the different priorities that have been set out there, all the different actions that could be taken, what do each of you think is the most important single thing that ought to be done in terms of US policy? So what is the one, you know, so for the members of the uh, commission, you had 80, uh, what's the most important thing that you think should be done? Nicole, you've just finished up a book. You clearly had lots of ideas. What's the single most thing out of that? So, um, Senator King, why don't you start us off? I'm going to modify the question a bit by saying the two most important things. I think uh, the first is one that we really haven't discussed in all at, at all, and that is the establishment of a clear, articulated, public doctrine of deterrence. Right now, our adversaries essentially pay no price for attacking us. Uh, they, you know, some sanctions here or there, but there's no, there's no uh, cost imposed for an attack beneath the, the level of a, of a physical attack. 
And I think that's the problem. I mean, that's why we keep, they keep coming after us. Why wouldn't they? Uh, it's cheap. Uh, Putin can pay 8,000 hackers for the price of one jet fighter. Uh, and there's no deterrence. I want the people in the Politburo to say, gee, if we do this, if we go after those American elections, some bad things are liable to happen to us, and maybe we ought to not do that. In other words, I want them to know there's a cost imposed. So that's number one. I think there needs to be a clear deterrent uh, establishment, uh, establish of a deterrent posture. It's not the same as nuclear deterrence, but in that, in the realm of if you do this, something bad will happen. Number two is the, the organization, the National Cyber Director. I think one of their problems right now is the sort of incoherent uh, structure that we have. One of my uh, principles of, of management is uh, messy organization produces messy policy. And right now there's no uh, central driving force and so I think a national cyber director, not with a huge office, but with an opportunity to coordinate, oversee uh, the other agencies, those are the two things that I think are the most important of all the things that we talked about. And how optimistic are you about um, that making it into uh, the NDA? Well, the, it, it, there's a placeholder in the committee. Uh, we voted uh, last week, and there is a provision that talks about the national cyber director, but it it's literally a placeholder so that there can be further discussions with Mike Rounds, who's the chair of the cyber subcommittee with the administration. So essentially, we're still working on it. I'm really hopeful, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to put a percentage on it, uh, but it's so logical. And, and as, as I think uh, Mike mentioned earlier, we have strong support, for example, from Ron Johnson, the Republican chair of the uh, 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 Homeland Security Committee, uh, he believes this is important too. So I'm hopeful, and it, basically it, it's going to be persuading the administration, I think. And this isn't about President Trump. This is about any president. This is, this is a favor to the president, giving them someone that they can hold accountable in this, in this area. Uh, so I, I think there's a reasonable shot at it. As far as the declaratory deterrent policy, again, that's really up to the administration and the president. That's uh, Congress can talk about those things, but ultimately, uh, the executive has to promulgate, you know, what our what our strategy is. Representative Gallagher. Uh, well, I agree with everything Angus said, but maybe just to kind of add to that, uh, if you get the organization piece right, I mean, the goal is for a better organized federal government to do better public-private collaboration, right? Because in cyber, you know, the federal government, I would argue, is not the main effort. It, it is the supporting effort. And as Angus alluded to before, most of our critical infrastructure is in the private space. And so I really think that some of the most important recommendations are all of those in a report that aim at elevating and empowering CISA. CISA is not a, a household name like NSA or, or Cybercom, but CISA is supposed to be that interface with the private sector, uh, the private sector's preferred collaborating partner. And I think if we can, you know, get that piece right, if we can make CISA cool, not, you know, not that it isn't right now, uh, <laughs> I think public, better public-private collaboration flows from that small part of reorganization that we're recommending. Nicole. Well, and I'll just, just to add to Mike's point, I mean, I think a lot of people have had a lot of skepticism about Homeland Security being the agency charged with, charged with our defense in, in many ways. But I think over the last few years, CISA, um, I think people have put their skepticism aside. I think Chris Krebs has done a really great job um, and a good job being the face of that agency and in being, uh, you know, coming from Microsoft, being able to recruit more people from the technical community um, where he needs them. So just to, I'll throw him a bone on, on this Zoom uh, meeting. But I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people really roll their eyes when they think about regulation being the answer to all our digital uh, problems right now. And I roll my eyes sometimes too. But I think one thing that really surprised me in my own research um, that I think would be really helpful guide for some of this is there was a global vulnerability report that was done um, about almost 10 years ago now by some, some academic researchers. And they just looked at country by country 
what are, what are the countries that are most secure um, in terms of their cybersecurity? And I think the metric they used was um, what percent of attacks on uh, on its machines are successful. And the safest country in the world is Norway. So Norway is extremely digitized, um, but what they have on us is they have made digital literacy and cybersecurity core to their curriculum, which I know is in your report. Um, they've also, um, they have a master plan. They have a cybersecurity master plan. They update it every year based on current threats. And um, it does things like, the things we've been trying to pass through legislation unsuccessfully for the last decade. Um, it identifies critical infrastructure. It sets up uh, mandatory requirements for those critical infrastructure operators. Uh, there are liabilities and fines for critical infrastructure operators who do not meet that bar. It requires them to go through basic common sense things like penetration testing um, and to use encryption and multi-factor authentication. And it's not rocket science, but Norway is the safest country in the world when it comes to cybersecurity. And then another really useful uh, case study they did was actually Japan, which over the course of one year um, upped its cybersecurity score by something astronomical, like 50%. And what they, what they saw when they looked at what was the difference that year was Japan came up with a master, similar master plan for cybersecurity. And they really put a lot of effort into digital literacy, um, cybersecurity training, both in the public and private sector, fines. They were the only national cybersecurity policy to mention the word air gapping. They put a lot of emphasis on setting up perimeters, um, non-digitized per perimeters around some of their core critical infrastructure. And the, this is something we could easily do here. We just unfortunately have a lot of strong lobbies um, and lobbyists who've argued that some of these really basic things that we would require from our critical infrastructure operators are too burdensome on the private sector and that's just nonsense at this point. When you look at the cost of cyber attacks related to terrorism these days, the cost of cyber attacks is, is now by some estimates in the trillions, whereas we see the cost of terrorism going down. So it's time to really focus on this issue and think about um, what we're losing in terms of, of intellectual property um, and business and uh, every day from, from cyber attacks and ransomware attacks and intellectual property theft. So uh, yes, master plan, um, look at what some of these other countries have done and, and implement it here. So I'll close by, um, I think it brings us full circle. Uh, for me, it's to, uh, in that master plan, go after the risk that you identified in your answer to the very first question, which is a particular focus on internet of things. Uh, essentially, my feel is that we are recreating almost all the mistakes that we made with internet security when it was the last generation in terms of it being used for communication. Uh, we're basically recreating all of those mistakes as the internet alters into an internet of things where it's about operation. Um, and the numbers uh, tend to you know, back that up when it comes to how little security we are baking in because of this absence of um, requirements. I mean, uh, one study found that 98% of IoT traffic is unencrypted and 57% of the devices out there right now are vulnerable to um, a medium to high level threat. Uh, and, you know, as we play out in the burn-in book, but also we can steer the audience to a, a new infographic that we have um, on the New America website, you, um, it basically uh, lays out 10 different ways that you could hack the city of Washington, D.C. by going after a number of these different IoT elements that we've talked about in the um, discussion today. Uh, whether it's smart homes, whether it's the move into having um, drones, whether it's uh, trains, to uh, water treatment plants, you know, the um, reference of uh, what Israel suffered in the last week, someone going after a system and uh, targeting the chlorine levels. Um, I can tell you from actually having done the research, uh, if you think that the um, small towns and small businesses that do water treatment uh, upriver on the Potomac uh, have better cybersecurity than the Israeli government, uh, 
uh, I've got really, really bad news for you. Um, and so we, in my sense, we need to, uh, we're, we're baking in vulnerability right now that we're going to regret for the next 15 years, much like played out with the last 15 years related to cybersecurity. So I'd love us to get on top of that. Um, this has been a, just a, a fun, rich conversation. We've hit on so many different topics. So I uh, want to thank again, uh, all the attendees who joined us, but in particular, our distinguished panel Hill. Thank you very much for giving up uh, your time to have this conversation with us and uh, to everybody out there, stay well.